All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us for the third and final webinar in the Build Your Run series. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. Um, before we get started with this content, content today, do me a favor, uh, silence any technology, cell phones, TVs, anything around you. A lot of content to get through today. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of great information that you'll will help you better fine tune your running moving forward. So wanna make sure you get the most value from this content. Take a second and look around on your screen, move the mouse around. You should see a Q and A button either on the top or the bottom. Um, this is what we'll use throughout the webinar to communicate. If you have any kind of questions or comments, anything you want me to clarify uh, and go more in depth on, feel free to drop a, a question, comment, just anything in that Q and A um, feature. At the very end of the webinar today, we will be raffling off one free month in the Healthy Running Program. We'll talk about that more once we get to the very end, but just know those of you that potentially have to jump off the webinar at some point, um, I will be sending an email out tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So for those of you that um, by chance can miss that at the very end, you'll get a webinar replay, see the raffle winner, um, so make sure you don't miss that. So a lot of content to, to get started with, so let's, let's get moving here today. What to expect from this webinar? So what I wanna do is really take a research-based approach like all of my webinars and a lot of the content that I put out, not just trying to give you my opinion on things, but what does the research actually tell us at this time? So we'll look at the, um, again, how again, running and the human body work together, the, the specific demands of running on the body, and then how we can manipulate running mechanics in some way to improve performance, re reduce our likelihood of injury, or just see better results with our running. Again, this is not a, a webinar where I'm going to say, here, you need to do this. Let's look at the, what the research tell us. Let's think about our own individual situations, and let's take bits and pieces of these things to and create a more individualized approach moving forward. Once we talk about different deficiencies when it comes to running mechanics, we'll go into depth on specific drills, uh, exercises, drills, a lot of different ways to retrain running form. And then hopefully moving forward, you should have in, with this information, kind of a clear cut action plan on, on some things that you can implement with your running moving forward. Before we get started with the content, let me take a second and introduce myself. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. I'm a licensed athletic trainer, strength conditioning coach, currently living in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Um, what I do is I run what's called the Healthy Running Program. With this program, can runners with a, a lot of different goals, whether they're recovering from injury, looking to improve performance, um, again, with the goal is to get faster, move better, reduce the likelihood of injury. We do this through slow motion running analysis, orthopedic evaluations, moving assessments, one-on-one -on -one group, functional training, and also rehabilitation, soft tissue manual therapy called active release techniques. So to get us started here, we really need to take a second to understand the demands of running. Before we go to change running form and make adjustments, why are we doing these things? Running is a very single leg plyometric-like activity. And if you think about that first bullet right there, a couple of key things I want you to take from that. Single leg, first and foremost, and plyometric. Running as you run, and only one foot is in contact with the ground at all times as opposed to walking where we do have this double, uh, double support phase. So we need to make sure a lot of our, our strategies to get stronger, or prevent injury are actually on one leg. So single leg strength training and, and focusing on that single leg, leg aspect of the sport. Plyometric like running essentially is, is this bounding or jumping from one leg to the next. So think about it from two different lenses. One, there's a lot of force coming down on that leg as you land and during that stance phase of running. And two, we need to train this plyometric uh, or ability to be powerful, uh, spring-like, absorb and create energy to be successful as a runner. Although, again, one thing that is good and bad when it comes to the sport, running is very predictable. So when it's predictable, this is great from a, a movement and mechanics standpoint. We can, and from studying and, and looking at the research on running, we can adjust and manipulate those things to be better as a runner because we know this is that same movement pattern you're executing step after step for mile after mile. On the other end of the specter, spectrum, because it's predictable, there's a greater risk of injury. When you're only moving in one plane of movement for mile and mile on end for days, weeks, months, and years, at a time, depending on how long you've been a runner, that, that does carry a greater risk of injury. So making sure you're playing different sports, you're incorporating strength training or dynamic warm set and moving you in multiple planes of motion, these are the kinds of things that are needed to help see the most success and longevity as a runner. 
from a range of motion standpoint, there's actually not a lot of range of motion required to be a runner uh, or to really move through that running pattern. So people usually call running a, a mid range sport, as opposed to if you look at gymnastics or dance or some of these other activities where you need a lot of range of motion to be good at that sport. You don't need a whole lot when it comes to running. And we're going to dive into that more in a second. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, being a plyometric like activity, the body often sees forces anywhere from two to six times its body weight as you strike and land into the ground. So it's a very, uh, it's a very challenging and demanding sport on the body as you perform those very high magnitude repetitions step after step. So promoting good mechanics, adding a strength training program to make yourself stronger and more resilient to the demands of running are the things that are needed to see the most success. From a range of motion standpoint, like I mentioned a second ago, um, again, we don't need to be like this woman on the right side of the screen. That's great and all to be able to have good flexibility, touch the ground, move through these extremes of range of motion. But when it comes to running being a very mid-range sport, we don't need a lot of motion. Specific areas that we want to promote to make sure we have optimal running mechanics, and we'll touch on this later on as well, hip extension, ankle dorsiflexion, and big toe extension. Those are the three areas that we want to make sure we have the minimum requirement to move properly throughout that running cycle. If you have any limitations in range of motion in those areas, that's usually when you'll start to see compensations within your running cycle. So just to show you what those look like, first and foremost here, we have hip extension. You look at this woman on the right side of the screen, she's in her kind of push off phase of running. Her, her hip is extending, usually 10 to 15 degrees. She's pushing off to propel the body forward. Um, this is what we need when it comes to and creating that power and that explosiveness within our stride. Next up, ankle dorsiflexion. So this guy here, he's kind of at that mid stance phase of running, um, but as your foot is fixed on the ground, your body travels over the stationary leg, he needs to get into ankle dorsiflexion to get to hip extension. So a lot of times I hear from runners that say, hey, I, I don't extend well for my hips or I have limited hip extension. We need to look at some of these other things to determine is it actually hip extension that's the issue or is it the ankle or even great toe, okay? Big toe is that third area that we want enough range of motion because if not, we're unable to get and actually push the body up forward. Other than these three motions, it's okay to have limited flexibility in some way, but these are the big three that are required for optimal, uh, optimal range of motion mechanics as you run. Okay, so now just to consider some of the, the muscle contributions, because when we look at running mechanics, fatigue plays a role in that. So we want to make sure we're, we have enough strength, we have enough endurance to continue to run, increase our distance as we train for that goal race, whatever it is. So having that foundation, the underlying foundation in place to maintain endurance as we get further into runs is important from a mechanics standpoint. There are a couple key areas that we want to focus on and hopefully you're incorporating some type of strength training routine. Um, I think that's something that as we get further along with, with sports and athletics, we start to see the need for strength conditioning, performance training, any type of weight lifting. Years ago, we would kind of just uh, play our sports and, and that was enough. Now as competition is getting and much more <laughs> much better. You were, we're achieving things that we were not achieving years ago. We're starting to see some of these other disciplines intermix with running. So some key areas we want to make sure are strong. Uh, hip flexor muscle group, hamstring muscle group, quads, uh, and then soleus. So if we look at some of these numbers across the varying speeds, we'll see hip flexors and hamstrings. The faster you run or pick up your pace, the more muscle force is placed upon those muscles. So those muscles have to do, I mean, sometimes in some instances, uh, about six times as much as they do at a slow speed. So if you're going from incorporating some kind of speed training or you have never done any, you've always run a conversational pace and you're adding speed training into the mix, just know that as you run faster, these muscles are required to do that much more. So making sure they have the strength and the resiliency to that speed. The quad in the calf specifically are two areas that are very big contributors to, to running. They help really work against that, that vertical loading. So if you think of as you run and you move horizontally, gravity and body weight is acting down on the ground. The quad and the calf specifically are preventing 
that excessive force going down into the ground to keep us upright and in a good position as we run. So we're making sure we really emphasize good strength training in all of these areas is super important. With that being said, we want to have a good strength training, enough flexibility. Again, but I don't think by any means we need to work on, if you have enough flexibility, do I think you need more flexibility? No, you need the minimum requirement to have proper mechanics. Usually more does not necessarily mean better in the whole range of motion and flexibility category, but tying these things together, strength training, range of motion, injury prevention with a good routine when it comes to running, optimizing mechanics, following a good structured program. This is what's required to really see good results when it comes to running, not just doing one or another, connecting these together in one, one cohesive program that works best for you. When we're thinking about altering or modifying our running mechanics in some way, we want to not just do things to do things. In my opinion, uh, general strategies get general results. So let's think about us first as individuals and figure out what are those things we can modify to see better results within our running rather than following some of these, these blanket recommendations that you'll see out there. Firstly, anatomy. What is your anatomy telling you? Your position of your body, alignment, hips, knees, ankles. What do these things look like? Again, through our own development, growing up as kids um, to where we are now, the life has placed a specific set of demands on the body, which has caused us to be shaped into a certain structure. We need to take these things into consideration rather than automatically trying to adopt some type of corrective running strategy. Is our body in the best position possible to really adopt and see success with that? Or do we need to try something else because our anatomy says otherwise? Next up, biomechanics. How well do we move? How efficient are we as movements when it comes to neuromuscular control, stability, balance, uh, being able to really promote proper movement patterns? Um, what I like to do when it comes to biomechanics is, yes, let's look at someone on a treadmill with a slow motion running analysis, but let's also complete an orthopedic evaluation and movement assessment to see how they move in a controlled environment. If I'm seeing issues in the controlled environment, there's a good chance that I need to fix or resolve that first before I start telling them they need to adopt this strategy within their running. So making sure they can express uh, the kind of the capabilities that their body has. Injury history, always important when it comes to running. The, the chance of injury is very likely, a lot of the research articles show anywhere from 30 to really 80% of runners, I know it's a huge range and sounds, sounds crazy being in a range that big, but there's a lot of research that's been done on this. So a lot of people get injured each and every year, and we really need to work on respecting our injury history a little bit more. A lot of times when I talk to runners uh, through that initial consultation, I'll ask you, hey, what types of injuries have you suffered from in the past? And they, they almost hold back a little bit more than they should. We talk about, oh, I had these big injuries, one or two things over the last couple of years, but they kind of hold back, hey, in college, I was a softball player, I sprained my ankle consistently, or I suffered my hamstring when I did this years ago. Um, we need to make sure we consider injury history. So as we start to modify running form again, does that need to be taken into consideration? And then also with our strength conditioning program, can we target those things to make your make you stronger, more resilient in the process rather than uh, overlooking these things completely. And then lastly, what are your running goals? Uh, a lot of times we, we want to change things just to change things. How do these changes align with your goals specifically? Is it to run a longer distance? Are you going from half marathon to full marathon? Are you going from half marathon, but you want to pick up speed with the 10K or 5K? That could be completely different, different recommendations when it comes to altering or modifying running form. So what I wanna do here, take a second, take a quick break. Um, mixed into this webinar today, I have a, a couple little quick quizzes I want you guys to run you guys through, see how well you're paying attention, um, see what you're getting from the content so far today. So this first one, three questions based off some of the information I just talked about. Um, take a minute or two, answer these questions, do the best you can. I'm gonna wait till about 80% of people answer this to move on. So first question, the body can experience up to how many times its body weight and ground reaction forces while running? Going back to the demands of running, is it two, four, six, or eight times your body weight? And we're looking for the greatest value there. Question two, which joint actions are required for natural and un uninhibited range of motion to promote optimal running mechanics? Um, is it ankle dorsiflexion, hip extension, great toe extension, knee flexion? Question three, which muscles experience the greatest amount of peak muscle force while running? 
This is multiple choice as well. Calf, hip flexors, hamstrings, or quadriceps. So I'm gonna give you a second to answer some of those. So we're gonna wait till about 80% of people complete this. Not gonna wait for everyone, just in case someone's already uh, walked away or jumped into a quick bathroom break or something. See a couple changes being made. Nice job. We're at seventy-one percent right now. We'll wait another couple seconds or so, so we can get one or two more people. All right, let's get wrapped up here. Okay, so let's let's review here. So body weight. Uh, looking when running anywhere from it's a two to six times so six times on the greater end there's a lot of new research that's been out actually from Vanderbilt University last year showing some of the internal force on the body can be significantly greater but from ground reaction standpoint up to six times body weight which is and if you take a second with your phone calculate your body weight times six and think about how much force is coming down to the ground pretty significant uh, which joint actions are required for natural in uninhibited range of motion to promote optimal running mechanics. So top three are the ones we're looking for. Ankle dorsiflexion, hip extension, and great toe extension. Uh, knee flexion, not so much. Through the swing phase, you will can need that knee to bend, but obviously in an, an unloaded position, not as valuable or, or needed there. Um, which muscles experience the greatest amount of peak muscle force? So multiple choice here. We're looking for every single one of those. Okay. So these are just the top, the calf, yes. The calf is, is, is kind of talked about as being that powerhouse, like I mentioned, of running. So definitely high up there. The hip flexors and the hamstrings actually in the end see more force than the calf, but the calf is one that the soleus muscle in particular uh, is, is constantly called upon to see just so many vertical loading forces as you run. All right, guys, so let's move, let's move on. Let's dig in here. So specific things we want to look at when it comes to riding for running first one being foot strike pattern. Um, why we study, why we study the foot strike is because it's been suggested over the years and we see through some of the literature that the greater the magnitude and the, uh, the quicker and the rate of change of how much force you're uh, impacting on the body during foot strike could have really strong contribution to running related injury and injury risk. So what we want to study with foot strike pattern is as we change our foot position, as we strike the ground, can we offset that risk of injury, reduce loads or shift loads to other areas of the body? Um, one of those, I think you'll hear a lot of people talk about switching from a, a rear foot to a mid foot. We'll talk about that in a second because that's a little controversial topic. Three foot strike patterns here that are recognized uh, going from left to right. We have forefoot, so landing more anteriorly on the shoe. Midfoot is more dispersed on the entire bottom of the foot and heel or rear foot is obviously striking more from the heel of the shoe. Let's talk about each one individually for a second and, and, and what we see with some of the research. So rear foot strike pattern or heel strike pattern, which you might see for, hear from me a little bit more here, is landing more at the posterior region of the shoe. You can see that runner there on the right side of your screen gonna strike down through the heel of the foot. Um, Interesting thing is about 89%, and I've seen some of the research vary from 85 all the way to 95% of runners display a heel strike or rear foot strike pattern. Um, this is associated just because it's more of a, a bony shock absorption pattern. You think of what's happened as the foot strikes the ground, heel is hitting the ground, a lot of force is going up the tibia into the knee and then to the hip. So it's more of a, it's associated with higher vertical loading rates. Um, and just because of how you're striking the ground with that pattern, you may potentially be, not always the case, be more susceptible to tibial stress fractures, plantar fasciitis, just due to that high load um, from a bony shock absorption standpoint. Midfoot strike pattern. So this is landing, you can see that foot right there, again, a little bit possibly more forefoot in that picture, but landing equally or, or force that's equally distributed on the bottom of the shoe as you land, shoe and foot. So because you're landing with more surface area in contact with the ground initially on that foot strike, load is dispersed equally throughout the lower extremity. This is one of those reasons why a lot of people, especially look at good form running in, in different in running stores and groups that promote midfoot strikes, may say that the midfoot strike is more advantageous. Um, however, it's just a different way to observe a, a, a absorb load as you land. It's not necessarily better or worse. It's just different, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, 
we have forefoot strike pattern. So forefoot, we're landing more towards the ball of the foot. As long as that heel is in the air as you land, that's kind of helped you quantify that's a, a forefoot strike pattern. So the anterior region of the foot strikes first. Because you're landing in more of this plantar flex position, there is a higher eccentric energy requirement at the calf. The calf does a lot more work initially to absorb force as that foot comes down in contact with the ground. So because of that, you may be more susceptible of Achilles tendinopathy and calf strain. So you'll notice that there are some injuries on either end of the spectrum. If you look at heel versus forefoot, um, biggest thing to realize when it comes to foot strike is load is load, but we're just changing which structures of the body have to absorb that load. Just to show a couple of real life examples of different foot strikes. I'll get both of them playing here side by side. Um, on the left side here, very pronounced uh, heel striker. You can see there as she strikes the ground throughout the, throughout the heel of the shoe. On the right side here, we have a slightly forefoot striker, very close to being midfoot, but a little bit more forefoot than, than midfoot. As you can see, that heel is slightly elevated on initial foot strike. Um, again, very different foot strike patterns here. There's one better than the other, not necessarily. These might be different or adopted because of specific injury histories, anatomy requirements while they run, um, but two different runners and different strategies with their running. Now, what does the research tell us on foot strike? We talked about what, uh, what the differences are between each foot strike. A very interesting research here. Running a long distance may require a rear foot strike to minimize the meta metabolic cost of running, while a more anterior foot strike or forefoot strike may be necessary to run faster. So very interesting to understand that over, over the years when we have gone from barefoot running to now wearing these shoes with cushion underneath, we've actually shifted or evolved to go and actually wear uh, have more cushion in the heels, which we land in that position more readily because it's a, a softer position on the foot. So when we look at running shorter distance, faster distance versus longer distance, landing with more of a, a heel or rear foot strike pattern uh, actually might be more metabolically efficient because we're now absorbing a little bit more through our bony structures rather than those muscular structures, which require in the storage and release of energy, which requires a little bit more en uh, you know, energy in the process or, or muscular demand. So as we run faster though, obviously we want to shift. There's a little bit more range of motion running faster, a little bit more of a trunk lean forward. Um, typically to be more forceful and to be quicker as you run, you want to strike further forward in the shoe to create that power, that elasticity to push off. So different strategies are, are typically uh, seen depending on the, the, the distance of your running. So collectively, the evidence suggests that switching from one foot strike to another may result in exposure to different types of injury mechanisms rather than one foot strike being more or less injurious than the other. It's just different when it comes to foot strike. Heel strike, we talked about plantar fasciitis, tibial stress fractures, forefoot being Achilles tendinopathy, calf strains. We're just shifting loads on different tissues of the body as we absorb force. So yes, they might be, one might be better depending on your goal as a runner, your distance, your injury history. But if we look at the research overall, uh, it's just different loads which could still predispose us to injury in some way. So in the fact that um, changing foot strike may result in stressing a tissue that is nor, 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 not normally stressed when running with one's habitual pattern. This is something that's very important to understand. If someone's just generally telling you, hey, you're a heel striker, switch to midfoot, does your body have the, the strength, the tolerance, and the resiliency to handle that different foot strike pattern? It's not just all of a sudden you can change from one to the next and continue to run and build up your mileage as needed. You might need to incorporate some type of strength training on the front end and quickly changing patterns as you run could be something that does predispose you to injury. Okay, so Kelly asked a quick question, just wanna answer this right now. Kelly, will today's recorded presentation be shared? Yes, so you are going to get the presentation after we finish, the, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. You're going to get a, a replay of this webinar, so you can watch it at that time as well. Now, into our next study. And I really want to share this, even though it says a lot of the same stuff. This just came out in 2019, so it's the most recent, uh, recent research on foot strike pattern. It compared rear foot strike patterns and non-rear foot strike patterns, so heel strikes versus midfoot and forefoot in relation to injury, running economy, and biomechanics. What they found with this was there was no relationship between strike pattern and injury risk. So changing strike pattern cannot be recommended for an uninjured rear foot strike runner. 
So if 89% of runners have a rear foot strike pattern, unless you're injured, this research study is showing us there's really no need to change your strike pattern. If you're someone that has a, a more extensive injury history or you're currently suffering from an injury, it could be advantageous, advantageous to change it, but we don't want to change it just to change it. Okay, so very important to think about here since we see a lot of confi conflicting information out there when it comes to strike pattern. Now, if we go to stride length, stride length is super important to think about. There's a couple different areas of stride length we want to look at um, to determine, again, are we running efficiently? Are we landing in the right position? Are we pushing off properly? And what goes into that? Stride length is defined as the successive ground contacts of the same foot. So as you land, right foot, push off, come back to right foot, that's your stride length. So when running speed is kept constant, stride length and stride frequency are inversely related. What that means is as you run, if you have a longer stride length, typically your stride frequency is shorter. If you have a short stride length or you're taking smaller steps as you run, you have a higher stride frequency. So stride length and cadence or, or stride frequency really go hand in hand here because they have an inverse relationship. A couple of areas we want to focus in on specifically when it comes to stride length. Uh, on the left side there, you'll see initial contact or how that, where that foot is, is landing in relation to the ground, because stride length is overall distance you're traveling. So initial contact where in relation to the body is that foot. On the right side of your screen, you'll see the toe off or the push off or, or uh, sorry, propulsion phase of running. So two areas we're gonna key in on here. When I'm usually doing a running analysis, the key things we're looking for is that athlete over striding. Where is their foot landing in relation to their center of mass? The further that land, the foot lands out in front, the more negative consequences we'll typically see because load uh, is a lot greater up the kinetic chain. So just to show you a little bit here, over striding, this is the same young lady I showed you earlier when we were looking at heel strike. Not necessarily concerned with her heel strike because she didn't really have any, uh, any injury history. I would want to correct her over striding first and foremost. So if we see there's going to be a line right here, line drawn right down from the knee down, that foot is landing out in front of that body center of mass that much. We want to get her to bring that stride in a little bit shorter to make sure she's not over striding. We'll talk about the, um, some of the negative consequences of that in a second. And then from the other end of the spectrum, we have limited hip extension. So this runner, very different runner, you can see as her strike pattern, her position, um, as she strikes the ground, getting more forefoot, and then we're looking at hip extension. So that left leg, if I draw a line down from her trunk all the way through her knee, that leg is barely getting into extension, if, if not getting into extension. So we wonder where her propulsion is coming from and what uh, deviations in her running form are going to have to happen to propel her from point A to point B if she's not actually pushing that body off forcefully to move forward. Common issues created from overstriding. So that was the young lady on the left side of your screen that was reaching too far in front with her steps as she strikes the ground. Well, what happens here? High braking impulse. So as you land, the body's landing out in front. It's almost acting as a, a, a small break. We're trying to move from point A to point B forward, but that foot's landing out in front. So it's actually stopping our momentum as we continue to travel in that direction. This is something obviously we don't want. We want to be as efficient as possible and consistently be moving forward rather than moving forward, stop, moving forward you know, stopping or slowing as we go. In addition to that, this high vertical ground reaction forces. So the more we land with an extended leg, the more load and vertical ground reaction forces is coming up that leg, especially with that heel strike we saw, which is more of a bony shock absorption strategy. And there's an increased energy absorption, so more force is going directly into the knee and hip joint, okay? Because of this, there's an increased risk of tibial stress fractures and patellofemoral pain, a lot, lot of load going up into the tibia, knee, and then hip joint up the kinetic chain. So one big thing I definitely recommend you, you thinking about or looking at, um, I see a lot of runners with knee pain, is, is there some kind of overstriding going on there? Do we need to adjust stride length to reduce force on that knee joint? When it comes to reducing overstriding, a couple things we wanna take into consideration here. First and foremost, increasing cadence would be a very helpful strategy here. We talked about stride length and tri stride frequency being inverse. So the longer the stride, the slower the cadence. The, if we can go the other direction, we can increase our cadence by about five to 10%. That will bring our stride in and prevent you from landing too far out in front of your body's center of mass. That's a, the easiest way to address overstriding. What we could also do is increase trunk leans. Usually something I do actually in the third, 
it, it, the third thing after addressing some of these gate retraining areas here is trying to lean just a few degrees again, five, seven degrees max from the ankles, not from the trunk, not from the hips. We want the ankles to dorsiflex to lean forward because if we're in a slight lean, we're not going to reach as far in front as we come down and strike the ground. So we're leaning more or we're striking more underneath the body. From a gait retraining, Now our next one here, very similar exercise, no cadence, uh, no metronome involved, but adding dumbbells to the hand. So I call this two dumbbell marching. And still, as I strike down, again, depending on your foot strike pattern, you can strike forefoot, midfoot, heel strike. Biggest thing is promoting that foot landing underneath the center of mass rather than reaching out in front. That's the key thing to take from, from this drill. But simple, these gate retraining drills and the marching drills, very easy to do as part of your dynamic warm-up or uh, somewhere at home. Awesome, just go. Thanks, John, appreciate the feedback there. Okay, so now let's move on. What you'll see typically when it comes to hip extension. So limited hip extension, if you're not pushing off the body as we saw with that young lady on, on the previous screen. So, if you're not extending through the hip, you'll typically see lumbar extension or arching at the lower back. Okay, that's a typical compensation because we want to tilt the lower back. Uh, we want to extend the lower back, tilt the pelvis, which helps us get this false sense of extension at the hip. What you'll also see is bounding. People that are either bounding, bouncing too high, or literally trying to jump and propel from one step to the next. If they're unable to push off from the hip, trying to spend more time in the air to increase that float phase to get more distance uh, on each step. Overstriding is something you'll see as well. So if you see overstriding, you have to look at limited hip extension. If someone is unable to push off and propel the body from that extension motion, that push off motion, you'll tend to see them reaching more in front to increase their time on the ground that they can pull through the stance face of running. And then from there, obviously, you'll see in ca increased cadence as well. Um, if they're unable to extend the hip, typically, Feet will, legs will move over, turn over a little bit more quickly just to get to that next stance phase to propel the body. So first and foremost, when we're looking at limited hip extension, we need to look at those three different areas we talked about earlier in terms of range of motion. So we have, in these drills, again, we would wanna look at the big toe, ankle, and hip. I just wanna show you a couple quick videos of ankle and hip mobility. So first one is a very simple, what I call wall ankle mobility. It's still, you're just trying to work on ankle dorsiflexion. That foot is staying flat. You're lunging the knee forward over the toes, trying to touch the wall. A big misconception over the years that we don't want the knees to pass the toes. We need that for normal mechanics as you run. So making sure within your strength training program, that's okay to a degree, depending on the load you're placing on the leg. Um, but definitely from a mobility standpoint, working on ankle dorsiflexion. And then kind of your traditional hamstring, uh, sorry, hip flexor stretching. You'll see half kneeling position, tucking the hips, lunging forward, work on opening up through the front of that joint. If you're unable to get into hip extension, we need to look at the opposite muscle group. So this right here will be the hip flexor muscle group right in the front of the thigh to make sure we have enough flexibility and mobility in the hip in that direction. Lastly, you always have to retrain something, right? We can't just assume that improving range of motion is automatically going to fix this movement pattern, which we have then developed as a result of our anatomy and our biomechanics. So in this video, Chris is working on a very simple single leg stance with hip extension exercise. You can see as he sets up here, pelvic tilt, he's just trying to find neutral because we know a compensation for hip extension is lumbar extension. So we want to limit lumbar extension, really engage the abs. And he's just trying to teach his hip 
to go into extension as he then bends and kind of goes through that little swing phase of running. Okay, so a couple of very good drills to work on to make sure you're, you have full hip extension or if you're lacking in that area, these are things that you need to work on on a daily basis. Okay, so. Now looking at different shock absorption mechanisms. Um, I wanna look at specifically foot pronation and then pelvic drop. These are two different ways to absorb force. So, go back through that, make sure I was doing that the right way. Okay, so foot pronation. People often say, hey, my foot pronates, how do I fix that? Pronation is a normal motion at the foot and the ankle, at the subtalar joint it's called specifically. But if you look at, we have different ranges of, hold on, make sure this is right, okay. Make sure we have different ranges of pronation. So we have this neutral foot and if that, that foot and ankle move to pronation, that's kind of a healthy range of how we need to absorb shock throughout the, the medial arch and foot to dissipate the force. But it's, as soon as we go into over pronation, we go too far in that direction, that pronation becomes an issue. So is pronation bad? No, pronation is a normal range of motion that's used to absorb force. It's usually the magnitude of pronation. So if you go through a big range of pronation or quickly going into pronation, that can increase your risk of injury. So just to show you, when pronation has gone wrong, we can see this guy on the left side of, his, of the screen here. Um, he's in somewhere in that, that stance, early stance, mid stance phase. Uh, that foot has been collapsing quite a bit inward. This is what we wanna stay away from. So it's bigger ranges of falling into pronation, quickly going into that position. And what we know through the, the research is excessive heel eversion, which is that specific position right there. Eversion is if the kind of the inside of the ankle is rolled in, the foot is rolled out to the side, is linked with tibial stress fractures, patellofemoral pel pain, and Achilles tendinopathy. So if you ever experienced that yourself in the past, looking at foot pronation, over pronation is important. These two videos are, are good to look at. Uh, very different runners. The one on the right I used before. Very two different pronation strategies here. On the left side, you can see, and specifically her left foot more than her right foot, strikes in a very neutral position, but we can see that quick roll into over pronation. Then we look at the right side of the screen, this young lady's landing in supination. So more of that really landing on the lateral border of her foot. And then as you slow this down, we can see she is pronating, as you owe everyone does. You land from the lateral border of your foot and then you quickly go to neutral. So they're both pronating to a very similar degree, just their pronation is happening, happening at different points of the running cycle. Not necessarily saying one is, is going to con cause injury or not. It really depends on how this runner is reporting symptoms, if they're reporting symptoms. But both of these could potentially be, could be an issue, but just showing them, showing you guys pronation is very different depending on how you're landing and striking the floor. How do you reduce overpronation? First and foremost, you need to get out of your footwear. I hear a lot of runners, uh, a lot of people with in injury history that say, I, I wear stability shoes, motion control shoes. When I'm home, I'm wearing uh, some kind of sandals with arch support or wearing sneakers in the house or something because they always have issues with the feet. Uh, we wanna use that to reduce symptoms as much as possible, but get out of the shoes to help retrain neuromuscular control, stability, strength of the feet and the toes. If we look at, and dexterity of the hand and fingers compared to the feet is usually this very big disconnect from one to the other. Obviously, we're using this every single day to do little things, typing and doing that, so we preserve this. Uh, we don't often work on that as much with the feet. I'm gonna show you a couple simple drills in a second to, uh, to address that. So improving foot and toe dexterity, improving neuromuscular control, stability of the foot, and then once you address those little things, reinforcing good control of the foot, as you're on a single leg and as you land with two to six times your body weight. Um, so we don't wanna just do these small little drills to strengthen and, and stabilize and improve neuromuscular control. How do we put that into the movement pattern of running with some kind of jumping landing drill? Um, but as always, anti-pronation shoes in the meantime, some kind of orthotics to assist you throughout that process without the end goal of not needing those as much because you're correcting the issue. So just to show you on the left side of your screen here, we have a couple toe dexter dexterity drills, uh, looking at neuromuscular control of the foot. First one's uh, foot doming. So it's kind of a little strengthening exercise of the medial longitudinal arch. Uh, it's called the flexor hallucis brevis. Muscle inside that arch that spans uh, from the, the big toe to the heel. 
just work on strengthening that muscle, trying to keep the toes down and not clawing the toes, but just sliding that foot back and forming the arch. What else you can work on is toe yoga, a little bit harder for most people. So now can we differentiate big toe and small toes? A very neuromuscular exercise, but a good one to, to teach that neuromuscular control because we want to have that underlying neuromuscular control if we're going to work on stability and really stabilizing the foot in an upright position. But at some point, we need to make sure that we are getting upright in a loaded position to retrain stability in single leg stance. So uh, this is a video demonstration. I try to take a small clip from this. I have a band under a heavy medicine ball. That band is under the base of my big toe, not actually the big toe itself. So I'm showing you my hand. I'm not under the tip of the toe. I'm right under the base there, which that would lift as you lose stability of the foot. All I'm trying to do is to maintain stability, keep the base of the big toe down on the floor there. And as I go up into single leg stance, can I hold it? It's a very good self-limiting exercise it's called because as I start to lose position of the foot, the band is going to actually start to, snap and lose its tension back. So I can't perform this exercise wrong because um, the band is gonna lose its position just like that if I, if I do. And then lastly, standing airplane is a very good uh, single leg exercise, getting you upright, loading the foot, knee and hip. Um, it's kind of like a single leg deadlift position or a standing, uh, kind of like a, a, even yoga, they do a position very similar to this as well. But now t rotating side to side, as I rotate, into that position, there's a tendency for that foot to want to roll to the outside edge of the, of the shoe, which I commonly see with a lot of runners. So you really have to stabilize that big toe, base of the big toe, down into the ground to maintain stability. It's a very challenging exercise, but one will be good to improve overall pronation of the foot. Now, if we move on, second shock absorption strategy here is pelvic drop. So, Pelvic drop is, a, again, another natural shock absorption motion at the pelvis. If we look at the image there on the right side of the screen, see those green lines there, um, somewhat level pelvis, but you look at the left side of the screen there, as that woman strikes the ground, her left side pelvis is dropping significantly. Um, we need to make sure, again, we, we want to promote close to the levelness of the pelvis. The pelvis should still drop a little bit, about three degrees or so, but anything more than that is losing stability. So is this motion bad? Is pelvic drop bad? No. When within normal range of the motion, it's a shock absorption strategy at the pelvis. It's again, back to pronation. It's how, how much range of motion you go through or how quickly you go into that range of motion, which increases your risk of injury. So pelvic drop contributes to excessive hip adduction. What that means is if we look at where the leg and the foot is in relation to the hip and the pelvis, if we think of you're standing upright, your leg is directly under your hip, that's a very neutral position. Adduction is if that foot is landing more underneath the body or towards the midline of the body. What this is actually related to is hip abductor strength, hip extension strength, so looking at your glutes, glute maximus, medius, and minimus, and then fatigue. And as we run, we're forced to stabilize over a long period of time. These muscles fatigue, you'll see more pelvic motion in the majority of runners. Um, so that is obviously linked with running injuries because it's a stability issue at the pelvis, which can translate to improper mechanics lower down the chain. Just to show you a couple examples here, not necessarily saying that's, that's, that's good or bad on the left side, but just showing you what it looks like as you strike the ground, since it's an area we don't really perceive as well uh, as we run. So as she strikes the ground, you can see the opposite side pelvis starting to drop there a little bit. And we want about three degrees. That's normal. Anything more than that could potentially increase your risk of injury. And if we look at this young lady on the right side, it's a different person, even though they're wearing the same color pants and shirt here. Look at the position of her pelvis as she sinks into that leg. Knees starting to trail in. And as she gets down to the bottom, she corrects the knee, but she loses her balance and stability because her pelvis, she's losing control for, through her pelvis. So we'd want to look at how is her foot stabilizing? How is she controlling her pelvis to see how well she stabilizes and aligns on one leg? Um, always like to make sure people need to do this in a controlled environment, like with this lateral step down movement here, and then put that in play as we run. So how do you reduce excessive pelvic drop, drop? First and foremost, we want to increase hip abductor and extensor strength. So strengthening the glutes. Um, like I mentioned before, glutes are not one of those muscle groups that experience the most load while you run, but they're super important around the pelvis and hip to provide stability, okay? So 
we want to strengthen these muscles and then also put these into a movement pattern to improve stability and control of the pelvis. A couple corrective exercises we can do to work on this. Hip bridges are, are great. Standard hip bridges work mostly on just glute maximus strength, but as we lift a leg in some way, whether it's hip bridge with leg extension here, hip bridge with marching, that's when we call in the hip from a stabilization standpoint, which will help improve uh, position of the pelvis as you run. Next up, one of my favorite exercises and one I usually have to progress people through from I mean, anywhere up to six months to really see good, good strength here. Lateral elbow stabilization, so strengthening glute medius and minimus in the single leg side plank. So either starting modified from the knee, progressing the full side plank or finding out where you fit into that progression. Now we always, when we're trying to improve a movement pattern, we need to get people upright into a single leg position to really work on controlling the pelvis. So here, hip hop to single leg stance, it's gonna be hard to see from the side view, but I'm gonna show you a view walking straight at me in a second, or say, sorry, straight at the camera. Right here, you can see I'm performing a slight hip hike. So all I'm doing is retraining the position of the pelvis, teaching my body what it feels like to be in a, a more neutral or elevated pelvic position on the opposite side. I'm just teaching it what it feels like not to drop as I'm in single leg stance. And then third, going back to marching. Can't go wrong doing the marching with the metronome, uh, two dumbbell marching here with a very small uh, step length here. It, it really doesn't require a lot of movement from the pelvis. So getting up into a single leg with some kind of load uh, is a good drill to improve overall stability and control through the pelvis. And then from there, you need to think about what you're doing with your other, other exercises, your step ups, your lunges, forward lunge, reverse lunge, uh, split squats, we always want to promote this neutral pelvis position as we go into those other movements. Oftentimes I see people trying to retrain stability and control with the pelvis, but then they do reverse lunges. And as they step back, the opposite side is just dropping. Um, it doesn't really help our purposes if we continuously feed into that, that poor uh, motor pattern. So teaching as we do a step up like this, can I start low, build up to a bench, maintain levelness of the pelvis? to build strength and stability, but also I'm always controlling that position. Okay, so now as we move on here, vertical oscillation is something very important to, to talk about. This is that bouncy motion as you run. Um, vertical oscillation is the amount of displacement vertically, also referred to as center of mass vertical excursion. So how high you're going up. Running be a very, being a very horizontal sport, we wanna limit that vertical oscillation and be, be able to move more forward. So we see the runner at the top, high vertical oscillation is a very bouncy motion up and down compared to the runner on the bottom. He's moving more horizontally with very little vertical displacement. The guy at the bottom, he's the one we really want to represent us as much as possible. We want to move from point A to point B horizontally. That's going to be a more efficient path than always be coming up and down. I know you've, you've seen those runners out there before. So Vertical oscillation is defined as the highest point during float, highest point you're in the air versus the lowest point when you're stabilizing on the ground. Different implications if we look at, again, the images on the, on the right side of the screen here, guy at the top on the right, in the top image, he is, we look at height of the pelvis, where he is at the lowest point versus where he is at the highest point, more distance than compared to the woman at the bottom. So not bouncing as much, a lot more stress uh, at the knee, knee and quad, so knee extensor moment, more vertical ground reaction force. Obviously, the higher you come up, as gravity and body weight come back down, there's more force on the lower extremity. And then also creates a braking impulse, like we talked about earlier with the overstriding. And if we're, our goal is to move from point A to point B, whether we're on a 5K, 10K, half or full, uh, we want to limit the disruption of that momentum moving in one direction which vertical oscillation will create some kind of breaking impulse. So just to show you a video here, this is Chris again, a couple of videos we did years ago on, on vertical displacement, vertical oscillation. Look at his head and, and just look at that black line on the, on the screen there at the back of the video. Look on the left side, his head is consistently going over that line, that, that bouncy motion he has as he runs. And look at the video on the right side of the screen. He's not even coming up to that black line there. So you can see two differences in terms of vertical displacement, uh, right side, left side being too high, right side being a lot better controlling that bounciness of his motion. What does the research tell us as far as vertical oscillation? Uh, the results show that reducing the magnitude of vertical, os os vertical displacement should be encouraged. We want to limit 
going up as much as possible, focus more on that horizontal motion of running. But uh, what we see there through the research is it's possible that reducing vertical displacement improves running economy, which we would think is, is obvious, right? If we spend less time going up, more time going forward, improves the overall efficiency, uh, oxygen requirement as we run. So trying to really focus on moving horizontally rather than vertically is important. What I like to use when I see runners with a high vertical displacement is the, the surprisingly the cue run softly helps a lot. If you think as you run, I want to run softly, it usually minimizes how much power and force you're putting up into the air, keeps you lower to the ground in a more compact position, and it allows you to absorb force better into that foot. Uh, surprisingly, I did some research on that years ago and showed it was effective to reduce vertical displacement. Uh, in addition, cadence. Cadence really impacts a lot of different things. Uh, increasing your cadence about five to 10% can reduce. Obviously, if we're, if we're getting the feet to turn over more quickly, that means there's less time going up into the air. So increasing your cadence five to 10% can reduce that vertical displacement. Now, perfect segue, let's talk about cadence. What is cadence? Uh, a lot of people wonder about this. A few people had questions about it with some of the, when I asked that, what do you want to get from this webinar today? Uh, cadence was a popular topic. So cadence is the number of steps you are taking per minute, also known as the step rate or step frequency. A couple of different ways we can uh, talk about cadence here. So, and hopefully, I know last time some of you said the video was loud. I'm going to let the video play for a second so you can see the difference. I'm going to stop it so I don't, it doesn't, doesn't cut me off here. Should your cadence be 180 steps per minute? It depends. Uh, it depends on where you are, what your preferred speed and your preferred cadence is. Uh, a lot of people recommend 180 is the gold standard. My opinion of this needs to be more individualized than telling everyone 180. I have some people that are starting in their 140s that I try to get to 155, 160. Other people that are 172, I have no problem telling them to go to 180. And I still have people at 180 that are over striding or not running properly that I tell, let's go up to 188 or or higher. So it needs to be really individualized to the runner. This video, I'm, I'm going to not speak for a second just so you can watch this and it doesn't uh, cut me off as, as we talk. But this is Chris running through a little cadence manipulation. So you can see him running at a slower cadence and then a faster cadence. So you can see that difference there of slower cadence versus faster cadence. That you can almost immediately notice some of those things that change. Lower, uh, shorter stride, less vertical motion, um, and just a, a quicker rhythm to his running. So what does the research tell us? Subtle increases in cadence can reduce the load on the hip and the knee. We talked earlier about overstriding, causing a lot of stress on the hip and the knee. This is a, a very simple way to help reduce that. Think of less breaking involved when it comes to landing and striking, less vertical ground reaction forces, a shorter stride length. Um, these are the things that are beneficial to improve success as a runner. Uh, cadence is a good thing from an injury prevention and a rehabilitation standpoint to reduce load, overall load on the lower extremity. A lot of research shows the differences between increasing cadence five to 10%. So I just wanna cover, cover that. Increasing cadence by 5%, to, or provides a, a reduction in step length, less center of mass vertical excursion, this is your vertical oscillation, reduces that braking impulse, so keeps us moving horizontally with better momentum, reduces the center of mass, uh, distance from the center of mass and heel, so this is your overstriding, prevents that leg from landing too far out in front, and increasing your cadence by 5% can reduce the amount of load on the knee 20%. So that's huge. If you're someone that suffered from any knee issues, patellar, uh, patella femoral issues, uh, IT band syndrome, patella tendinopathy, uh, any other previous meniscal tears or any other damage in the cartilage in the knee, just increasing 5% can reduce the amount of stress in that knee by about 20%. 10%, we see a lot of the same things, right? We see reducing the braking impulse, vertical oscillation, reduction in the peak ground reaction forces, but we look at the energy absorbed at the knee. 
10% increase in cadence reduces stress at the knee 34%. So that's huge. Does that necessarily mean you need to automatically increase 10 because you want the most again, stress reduction at the knee? No, not necessarily. I try to do the smallest increase in cadence that feels natural to that person without overhauling that completely to do the hardest thing. Because what we see is the rate of perceived exertion increases. The faster you increase your cadence, the harder it feels to maintain, to keep up with. So there, sh there could be a potential decline to your running from picking up cadence too much. A couple of different examples here. We'll get both of these playing. So on the left side of the screen, 164 steps per minute. I uh, usually use a metronome to, to tap in to see where these people are at. On the right side, 178. And very different cadence, difference from 14 steps per minute. But this is their preferred cadence that they tapped into. Everyone is very different when it comes to cadence. So really individualizing that is important. And now summarizing the research, increasing cadence needs to be individualized, like I said, to each runner based on their preferred speed and step rate. And there is no one size fits all recommendation. What's important to realize about cadence is if you go out there and use your conversation, go on your next conversational run and you look at your Garmin or you track your cadence in some way, um, we want to know what your cadence is for a given speed because as you go faster, your cadence should also increase. So we want to modify or manipulate cadence if that's something that's needed for you. If you're running at a, uh, let's say a nine mile pace, that is in your cadence is 162 and you're shooting for 170 steps per minute, you want to run that same nine, nine mile pace trying to achieve 172 because as we increase speed cadence naturally increases we want to keep speed the same get the legs to turn over more quickly increasing cadence between five to ten percent creates a substantial reduction in energy absorption at the knee and the hip again 20 to 34 percent reducing that load at the knee and the hip that's huge right that could that could be a, a game changer for some of you that have recurrent knee or hip issues thus Re-education and joint loading via step rate manipulation may have distinct benefits in the treatment and prevention of running related injuries. At the knee and the hip, I use cadence for a lot of other things just because we know it reduces vertical ground reaction forces. So even in the issues of plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendinopathy, um, some of those other things, cadence can actually weigh in and provide significant benefit to those as well. How to calculate your cadence. So a couple different ways we can do this. If you're wondering, hey, I've never looked at this before. How do I figure it out? If you count the number of right foot strikes over a one minute period and times that by two, that is the number of total steps you're taking per minute. If you're using a Garmin in the Garmin Connect app on your phone, some watches, the better ones, uh, mine doesn't, tells cadence in real time. And you can look at that as you run. Um, but if you go in that Garmin Connect app and you go into that function that shows you the uh, the time for that run, the, the pace, the heart rate, and then you scroll down, you can see cadence as max and average. Looking at those numbers is helpful. And then there's also a graph function as well, where if you're doing intervals, you can look at specific cadences uh, along that graph function. Uh, one thing I, I recommend, if you don't have a Garmin and, and counting for me, I, I can never count accurately when it comes to cadence. Uh, I have a higher cadence. Um, using the Run Cadence app was developed by a physical therapist in, in Seattle, Washington. You hold the phone in your hand, download the app, hold the phone, run for 60 seconds on a flat surface. It will tell you exactly what your cadence is and it also has a metronome feature that if we need to increase or modify cadence in some way, you can tap into that. So as we wrap up here, I want to do one last quick poll. Let's see. I'm gonna launch this last poll here for those of you Hanging on, landing with the midfoot strike pattern is the best for all runners, is that true or false? The two biggest areas of concern regarding stride length are this multiple choice, so pick more than one, overstriding, limited hip extension, limited knee flexion during stance, or understriding. Single leg exercises to improve foot neuromuscular control, stability and balance are essential to correct overpronation, is that true or false? Every runner should try to achieve a cadence of 180 steps per minute, is that true or false? So I'm gonna, Allow a few of you to get through this today. Right now, before we move on and start to wrap up over the next few minutes. Nice job. We're going to stop right here. 85% of you voted or, or 
were quizzed. So let's look at the results real quickly. Landing with a midfoot strike pattern is the best for all runners. No. Uh, looking at that research, uh, injured runners, potentially it could be, but all runners no. That's false. Biggest, uh, two biggest areas of concern regarding stride length are A and B, overstriding and limited hip extension. Single leg exercises, that is true. Improve foot neuromuscular control stability. Every runner should try to achieve a cadence of 180. That is false, right? We need to individualize that strategy depending on how your mechanics adjust as cadence increases. All right, so let's wrap up here. Where do you go from here? First and foremost, you need to identify your individual anatomical and biomechanical characteristics. Sounds complicated. How well do you move? What is your anatomy telling you? Don't change things just to change things. Understand what your body's story is and use that as the base to make improvements in terms of running form. Somewhat hard to do on your own sometimes. I mean, a lot of different research and stuff I sift through on a daily basis just to understand this stuff. Um, but don't think you just need to change things because it says in some article here, change this, this helps. Like looking at foot strike or, or cadence, you might not need to change any of those things, right? Even though they say land with the foot strike, achieve 180 steps per minute, that might not be the best strategy for you. Complete a slow motion running analysis. There's no better investment than to do some kind of running analysis. Um, a lot of times we think we run one way, but then when we slow things down on a camera, things are quite different. I often see that when I ask people, hey, how do you run? Tell me what you're running. How do you strike the ground? What's your cadence? They'll tell me something and then I'll look at them like, oh, it's a little, it's a little different than, I, than, than they depicted, right? It, what's important is determining the low hanging fruit which will create the biggest impact. Don't need to change everything. Uh, I usually start with most people by adjusting cadence. As you notice through a lot of this, I, I showed that increasing cadence five to 10% helps address vertical oscillation, overstriding, force into the knee and the hip, reduces ground reaction forces. So I start with that typically, and then I start to layer in some of these more complicated things as we go. So find what is the easiest thing to adjust first, and then go on from there, depending on how you, your body responds to that. Uh, I always recommend implement a, a program that ties all of these areas together. I think at this point, kind of goes without being said, we should be doing some kind of strength training or injury prevention training, um, but we need to tie together the strength training program or that injury prevention program with actually adjusting running form and running mechanics in some way. Oftentimes one without the other, uh, we don't really, see the best results possible. So I try to connect all of these things together into one cohesive, one cohesive program. So as we wrap up here, uh, like I mentioned, I want to raffle off one free month in the healthy running program. For those that are interested, by no means you have to enter your name in here, but I'm just going to launch another poll. What this healthy running program does is it will be an opportunity for you to evaluate running form, look at the weak links, uh, anatomy, biomechanics that I talked about earlier, and then we'll create a, a specific one month program for you moving forward. So you can see the, so you can work on these things and kind of get understand how things work together. So you can, we can move you more closely to your goals. Quick wrap, uh, qu couple questions here just to see who's interested. Do you want to enter? If you are currently a current client or going through a trial, a paid trial, uh, I'm happy to, if you win the raffle, refund your money on that. I want to make sure everyone that's on this webinar kind of gets the advantage of, of this. So are you interested in entering the raffle? And then second question, make sure you read that for a second. I always spend time the couple weeks after webinars, uh, scheduling different Zoom calls and phone calls with people. If you have any specific questions that you feel like, hey, we touched on, but we need to go more in depth with, this is not a sales call. This is just something that I can hopefully get see your goals, talk about your running history, um, what you have coming up and try to individualize these strategies for you. A lot of people that come on these calls and we spend some time doing some basic testing just to dig into these areas, then I can, can give you a little bit more individualization moving forward rather than just trying to make changes off of more of a general webinar. So take a second here. We wanna enter the raffle. Do you wanna chat at some point over the next couple of weeks just to talk more and hopefully improve clarity? So just like before, we're going to try to get to about 80%. We'll give another 15 seconds here or so. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So 
Thank you for taking the time. Happy Father's Day to the, the dads on the webinar right now. Um, I appreciate you taking your Sunday to, to spend some time with me here. Love talking about this stuff and, and hopefully I can help you more moving forward. Um, please expect an email tomorrow from me, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Check your spam folder. It sometime, sometimes ends up in there. This is gonna include the, the webinar replay, the winner for the raffle. So if you enter into the raffle, you wanna check that email. Uh, and I'm also gonna share every single webinar in this series, injury prevention, strength training, and plyometrics, and running mechanics. So you can reflect on all of those. I do have two spots currently open in the Healthy Running Program. I'm gonna provide two people with a discounted entry into that. So it's, it's $50 off, uh, usually costs $149.99. It's only costing $99.99. If you're interested in, if you do not win the raffle, getting a running analysis, finding your starting point and creating a program, I'm happy to give you that discount, but only two people only have space for two at this point. But once again, make sure you check your spam folder, okay? Any questions? And as you guys enter questions here, I'm gonna answer a couple that I got uh, before as people signed up for this webinar. Please write a question in at this time. Those of you that have no questions or need to get on with your day, I, I, I appreciate you guys and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend today. Okay, so a couple questions I wanna, I wanna talk about here quickly. Um, Pamela and Jessica talk, asked about cadence, cadence and how to change it. So biggest thing is figuring out your cadence and what deficiencies you see in terms of running. Um, I always recommend get a Garmin Connect or an app is the best way to find out what your cadence is and what you currently display. Uh, I, would, I would use that to figure out what your cadence is. And then from there, it's, you really have to look at your running more specifically. Having someone record you, I think in the slow motion feature on your iPhone right now is a very simple way to run past someone as they're holding the phone. And then you can see, am I overstriding? Am I going too high? Um, some of those things you can visibly see with your running. If you do notice those things, increase in cadence. Uh, I was re reading a research article the other day, I didn't include it into this webinar, but showing that people's preferred speed and cadence, it, you can increase their cadence by 3% naturally without changing or uh, without causing any extra, we call oxygen uptake. So. The, usually the, the more your body is moving, the more the, the quicker those legs are, are turning over. Uh, if you go too far in that direction, it's more of an energy demand on the body. But whatever your natural cadence is, 3% is actually something that remains within the natural ability of majority of runners they're finding. But 5 to 10% is something that more, more from an injury uh, standpoint, reducing load on the hip and the knee and recovering from an injury. So Mike says... Let's see, doing speed workout, is it better to change stride or cadence? Um, both are gonna, both should change, technically. Um, stride length should increase, cadence should increase just to cover more distance and get the legs to turn over more quickly. Um, cadence, so depending on what your conversational run is, cadence is usually faster than your conversational run. Um, biggest thing you wanna think about there with speed workouts, or I mean, really any type of running is, as you increase speed, you're, a lot of people try to increase their stride length by reaching forward to run faster. We want to focus on that extension component, driving from the hip, ankle, and toe to push off. So make sure you're, you're landing in the appropriate position and not, not over striding and over reaching to run faster. It's more propulsion, extension, and, and, and push off. Yukio, run keeper. Yeah, so run keeper, I'm not sure if that's the one I'm using or not. Um, I don't run tempo. So she said run, run keeper app tracks cadence. Another one you might want to look into is a lot of different ones out there. Uh, I use run tempo app to, use, to adjust mine, to set my metronome or metro timer app, run cadence, run keeper, a lot of different ones out there. Figure out which one works for you. Um, I think something to still check, check periodically. Another question, uh, so something I just kind of just spoke about, Beth asked how to gain hip extension during the gait cycle. We talked about this in the stride length um, section there, making sure you have the flexibility and mobility at the, the hip, the ankle, and the big toe. That needs to be there first and foremost. And then from there, retraining the body, how to get them to hip extensions, a couple of good exercises and drills beyond that single leg stance one with hip extension I showed. Um, and then sometimes even working on skipping um, single leg bounding drills could be helpful as well to, to retrain 
hip extension. Uh, Jennifer asked, changes to running mechanics to reduce stress on metatarsals and knees. So metatarsals and knees, uh, two very different areas. If we look at metatarsals, those bones throughout the foot, long bones in the foot, and then knee, obviously knee joint. Um, technically, first thing I would say is increasing cadence would reduce load. We know it's going to help the knee 5% reduce the load to 20%, 10% reduce the load to 34%. Um, what the increase in cadence sometimes does is shift load. If you're a heel striker, more foot foot, which would put more force around the metatarsals. Um, I think there was actually a good research article I, I wrote on my website about cadence, that even though you're somewhat loading more into the metatarsals, increasing cadence does still reduce the amount of plantar pressure. pressure the, so the pressure as you strike the ground into that whole metatarsal region. So I would say cadence would be the first thing I would, I would focus on with that as well. Any other last questions here as we wrap up? Got a few of you still hanging out here. Thanks for hanging on with me, Beth, Julie, Mike, Pat, Yukio. We're going to wrap up here. So if you have any last questions, write that in there right now. Anything I can help you with moving forward, feel free to reach out, email, call, whatever. Um, those of you that have worked with me before, no, I mean, whatever you need as far as just some suggestions or uh, assistance, definitely happy, happy to help you out with that. So hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Happy Sunday. Happy Father's Day. And I hope to talk to you, some of you guys soon. Thanks, guys.